In September 1918, Philadelphia held a planned Liberty Loan Parade to promote the government bonds that were being issued to pay for World War I. Some 200,000 people jammed Broad Street, cheering wildly as the line of marches stretched for two miles. Within 72 hours of the parade, every bed in Philadelphia's 31 hospitals was filled. In the week ending October 5th, some 2,600 people in Philadelphia had died from the flu or its complications. A week later, that number rose to more than 4,500. With many of the city's health professionals pressed into military service, Philadelphia was unprepared for this deluge of death. This is the story of the Great Influenza, by John M. Barry. For decades, scientists have debated, where, in the world the 1918 influenza pandemic started. Some medical historians and epidemiologists have theorized, that the 1918 pandemic began in Asia, citing a lethal outbreak of pulmonary disease in China. Others have speculated the virus was spread by Chinese or Vietnamese laborers, either crossing the United States or working in France. But Frank McFarlane Burnett, a Nobel laureate and a scientist who studied influenza, later concluded that the evidence was strongly suggestive that the 1918 influenza pandemic began in the US. Epidemiological evidence suggests that, the virus originated in, Haskell County, Kansas, early in 1918. It lies, west of, Dodge City. Haskell County was founded in 1887. It was named for Dudley C. Haskell, a former member of Congress. Here, land crops and livestock were everything. Farmers lived in close proximity to hogs and fowl with cattle, pigs, and poultry everywhere. The evidence further suggests that this virus traveled east across the state to a huge army base, that is Camp Funston, which, experienced the first major outbreak of influenza in America. Camp Funston was the largest of 16 divisional cantonment training camps built during World War I, to house and train soldiers for military duty. The camp accommodates more than 40,000 soldiers from the U.S. Army's 89th Division, who were stationed at the facility. Two weeks after the first case at Funston, on March 18, 1918, influenza surfaced at both Camp Forest and Camp Greenleaf in Georgia. 10% of the forces at both camps would report sick. In total, 24 out of 36 largest camps experienced an influenza outbreak that spring. The spread of influenza, was intimately related to World War I, especially the arrival of American troops in France. Later, it began its sweep through North America, through Europe, Africa, Asia, through isolated islands in the Pacific, and the world. There are three types of influenza viruses. A, B, and C. Type C rarely causes disease in humans. Type B does cause disease, but not epidemics. Only type A influenza virus cause epidemics or pandemics. Influenza viruses did not originate in humans. Their natural home is in wild aquatic birds. There are many more variants of influenza viruses that exist in birds than in humans. In birds, the virus infects the bird's gastrointestinal tract. Bird droppings contain large amounts of virus, and infections virus can contaminate cold lakes and other water supplies. Massive exposure to an avian virus, can infect man directly, but an avian virus cannot go from person, to person. This is unless it first adapts to human. The virus may also go through an intermediary mammal, especially swine, and jump to humans. Whenever a new variant of influenza virus, does adapt to humans, it will threaten to spread rapidly across the world. In humans, the virus attacks only, the respiratory system. Symptoms ranging from mild upper respiratory infection, fever and cough, to severe pneumonia, acute respiratory distress syndrome, shock, 
and even death. Influenza itself is nothing more than a membranous sort of envelope that contains the genome, the genes that define what the virus is. It is usually spherical, about one ten thousandth of a millimeter in diameter, and it looks something like a dandelion with a forest of two different shaped protuberances. These protuberances provide the virus with its actual mechanism of attack. Approximately 80% of the spikes are hemagglutinin, a trimeric protein that functions in the attachment of the virus to a host cell. The remaining 20% of the glycoprotein spikes consist of neuraminidase, which is involved in facilitating the release of newly produced virus particles from the host cell. On the inner side of the envelope that surrounds an influenza virion is an antigenic matrix protein lining. Within the envelope is the influenza genome, which is organized into eight pieces of single-stranded ribonucleic acid. The RNA is packaged with nucleoprotein, into a helical ribonucleoprotein form, with three polymerase peptides for each RNA segment. Influenza viruses spread from person to person, primarily through large particle respiratory droplet transmission that is, when an infected person coughs or sneezes near a susceptible person. It requires close contact between source and recipient persons, because droplets generally travel only short distances, approximately 6 feet or less, through the air. Once inside, the virus sets up residence, infecting the cells in the nasal passageways and airways. It initiates the infection by using the hemagglutinin molecules on the viral envelope. When the virus collides with the cell, the hemagglutinin brushes against molecules of sialic acid. Later, hemagglutinin binds with sialic acid. The binding process is like a hand going into a glove. As the virus sits against the cell membrane, more spikes of hemagglutinin bind to more sialic acid receptors. It works like a grappling hooks thrown by pirates onto the vessel, lashing it fast. Once this binding holds the virus and fell fast, the virus has achieved its first task, adsorption. Adherence to the body of the target cell. This step marks the beginning of the end for the cell, and the beginning of a successful invasion by the virus. Then the virus slips within the cell, in a kind of a, bubble, called a vesicle. Soon, the endocytic vesicle fuses with, the lysosome. A lysosome contains a digestive enzyme and an acidic interior and a digest invader inside the cell. Unfortunately for the host cell, the virus uses the acidity to its advantage. A nine channel, allows protons to enter the virus. The acidity inside the viral particle, disrupt protein-protein interaction, causing the matrix protein to detach from RNA genome. The acidity also triggers hemagglutinin to make a structural change, and it inserted itself into the vesicle membrane. Hemagglutin stimulate membrane fusion, causing the RNA genome and associated proteins can flow free into the cytoplasm. Soon, the genes of the virus spill into the cell. Then the genes penetrate to the cell nucleus and the viral genes begin issuing orders. Within a few hours these proteins are packaged with new copies of the viral genes. From the time influenza virus first attached to a cell, to the time the cell bursts, generally takes about 10 hours. Then, a swarm of between 100,000 and 1 million new influenza viruses emerges. Meanwhile, antibodies recognized the virus's outer spikes protein, and enabling them to bind them to the surface of the virus, preventing the virus particle from attaching to the host cell. Hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, can shift into different forms and still function. The mutation allows them to evade the immune system but does not destroy the virus. In fact, they mutate so rapidly that even, during a single epidemic, both the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, often change. If the mutation causes minor changes, that the immune system can still recognize them, and easily overcome a second infection from the second virus. But sometimes, mutations change the shape of the hemagglutinin or neuraminidase enough that the immune system can't read them. The antibodies that bond perfectly to the old shapes, do not fit well with the new ones. This phenomenon is called, antigen drift. When antigen drifts occur, the virus can gain a foothold even in people whose immune system has loaded itself with antibodies that bind to the older shapes. Antigen drift can create epidemics. Pandemics generally develop only when a radical change in the hemagglutinin or the neuraminidase or both. When an entirely new gene coding for one or both replaces the old one, the shape of the new antigen bears little resemblance to the old one. This is called antigen shift. When an antigen shift occurs, the immune system cannot recognize the antigen at all. 
Antigen shift occurs when influenza goes through major antigenic changes as a result of reassortment of genomes among different strains, including animals. Origins of hemagglutinin, in nuclear protein, and non-structural gene segment of the H1N1 virus are linked to avian flu virus which infected pig population around 1918. Reassortment mixes the avian flu virus and the swine flu virus which creates an entirely new hybrid virus. This increases the chances of a virus jumping from one species to another. Some biologists theorize that pigs provide a perfect mixing bowl because the sialic acid receptors on their cells can bind to both bird and human viruses. Since 1997, two different avian viruses, H5N1 and H7N9 have directly infected more than 2,300 people, killing more than 1,000 and threatening another 1,918 like pandemic. A well-known feature of the 1918 influenza pandemic is that the highest mortality rate was amongst young adults. The elevated number of deaths among young adults, aged 20 to 40 in Montreal and Toronto, is very striking between September and October 1918. Influenza virus was often so efficient at invading the lungs, that immune system had to mount a massive response to it. What was killing young adults a few days after the first symptom, was not the virus, but the massive immune response itself. This is called the cytokine storm. The immune systems of young adults, mounted massive responses to the virus that filled the lungs with fluid and debris, making it impossible for the exchange of oxygen to take place. Unlike French, Germans, and British newspapers which printed nothing negative about the pandemic because they don't want to hurt the morale of their army, Spanish papers were filled with reports of the disease. The disease became known as Spanish Influenza, or Spanish Flu, because only the Spanish newspaper was publishing accounts of the spread of the disease that were picked up in other countries. In June, Germans suffered initial sporadic outbreaks, and then full-fledged epidemics swept across the country. Then it struck Portugal, then Greece in July whilst death rates across England surged. Denmark and Norway began suffering in July followed by Holland and Sweden in August. In India, about 10 to 20 million people lost their lives due to influenza. Meanwhile, officials estimated that influenza killed 3% of the entire African population. More recent evidence suggests that the death toll was most likely to be more. The 1918 influenza pandemic, like many other influenza pandemics came in waves. The first wave killed a few, but the second and third wave would be lethal. There were three different waves of illness during the pandemic, starting in March 1918 and subsiding by summer of 1919. The pandemic peaked in the US during the second wave, in the fall of 1918. This highly fatal second wave was responsible for most of the US deaths attributed to the pandemic. Influenza virus has been implicated in many neuropsychiatric disorders. Carl A. Meniger was the first researcher to link influenza with neuropsychiatric, in 100 influenza patients admitted with behavioral changes in Boston between 15 September and 15 December 1918. Acute neurological manifestations have been reported during epidemics. An increased incidence of influenza-associated encephalitis has been reported in Japan, mainly in children. Other acute clinical neurological manifestations include seizures, Reyes syndrome, acute necrotizing encephalopathy, transverse myelitis, and aseptic meningitis as well as Parkinsonism, Guillain-Barr syndrome, GBS, which may occur during influenza infection. In 1992, an investigator studying the connection between suicide and the war instead concluded, World War I did not influence suicide, the great influenza epidemic caused it to increase. In 1918, when President Woodrow Wilson was in the midst of negotiating with his British and French counterparts the treaty to end World War I, he got a violent case of the flu. He survived, but he was never the same again, physically or mentally. Previously, Wilson had insisted that the treaty must represent peace without victory, and would not give in to the harsh terms French President Georges Clemenceau wanted to impose on the Germans. But after getting the flu, Wilson yielded to Clemenceau everything of significance Clemenceau wanted. No one can know for sure what effect the flu really had on Wilson, 
or what the effect of a gentler Treaty of Versailles might have been. Wilson's illness contributed to the rise of Hitler. Historians with virtual unanimity agree that the harshness toward Germany of the Paris Peace Treaty helped create the economic hardship, nationalistic reaction, and political chaos that fostered the rise of Adolf Hitler. By late November, influenza had made its way around the world. But the virus lost some of this virulence in second wave. Only weeks after the disease seemed to have dissipated, when some town beginning to lifted the lockdown, a third wave broke over the earth. The virus mutated again and become, radically different. By December, influenza cases increased in California, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisville, and, in New Orleans. On September 30, 1918, J.S. Cohen, a veterinarian, with the Federal Bureau of Animal Industry, had been attending National Swine Breeders Show in Cedar Rapids. Many of the swine were ill, and some of them deathly ill. Over the next several weeks, he tracked the spread of the disease, and the death of a thousand of swine. He concluded they had influenza, the same disease that killed humans, and published his conclusion Journal of Veterinary Medicine. Influenza was first isolated from pigs in 1930, by Shope and Lewis, with the virus isolated from humans several years later. The first isolation of a swine influenza virus from a human occurred in 1974, confirming speculation that swine origin influenza viruses could infect humans. In 1918, the world population was 1.8 billion, and the pandemic probably killed 50 to 100 million people, more than the World War I death toll of 20 million deaths. Today the world population is 7.6 billion. A comparable death toll today would range from roughly 150 to 425 million. So where are we now? What are the lessons? Before addressing those questions, we need to understand the commonalities of the few pandemics in the past that we have information about. All of the previous five pandemics came in waves. Some investigators now speculate that the 1918 virus circulates in humans for several years, before mutation allowed it to spread easily. If true, this would of course explode the hypothesis that Haskell was the origin. The most important lesson of the 1918 pandemic, a simple one yet but most difficult to execute is that, those who occupy positions of authority, must less the panic that can alienate all within society. Those in authority must regain the public's trust. The way to do that is to distort nothing, to try to manipulate no one. A leader must make whatever horror exists concrete. Only then will people be able to break it apart. <laughs>